700,000 shells for Ukraine, check, and more to come. Europe fulfills its obligations to defend its own freedom and sovereignty. Ultra-right and super-Russian Alternativa für Deutschland party wins elections in Thuringia and YFD's Parteigenosse is driving Russian-made car. And third topic, as usual, interview with an expert who twice served as Lithuanian ex-prime minister and surely knows all ins and outs of international politics, Andy Skubulis on UATV English. These topics in more detail in this very episode with me, Henry Keane, and our team of UATV English bringing you hard truth in easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. The EU has prepared 700,000 shells for Ukraine out of promised million, said Josep Borrell. We are currently at the level of approximately 700,455 millimeter shells. We are not yet at the target level, but the West is increasing its capabilities, said Borrell, stressed that the industry of the European Union countries is still increasing its capacity, so the production of ammunition continues. I want to insist that we will support Ukraine. We assume the possibility of targeting Russian territory, the diplomat added. Borrell stressed that the sending military instructors to Ukraine is not on the agenda. However, the creation of a coordination center in Ukraine is being discussed. Ukraine does not sit and wait for help to come. No way. Ukraine helps itself and produces its own shells. Fulfilling the request, the Ukrainian defense industry has already completed tests of its own 155mm shells and, according to the Ministry of Strategic Industries, plans to start the mass production in the second half of 2024. The first batch has already been manufactured. Active work is underway at several public and private defense industry enterprises to establish mass production of 155 shells. Ukri Oberon State Concern confirmed. Along with producing ammunition and its own facilities, Ukraine is launching joint ventures with Western defense companies. According to the Ministry of Strategic Studies, Ukrainian companies have agreed with two unnamed American firms and one European famous Rheinmetall to join produce 155 mm shells. It will take more than two years to launch joint ventures to produce 155s in Ukraine. The sale of shells from such production will be based on the market principle, but Ukraine will have the first hand right. In addition, the German French KNDS is teaming up with also unnamed Ukrainian partner to produce 155s under a KNDS license, which Mr. Commission said was the first of its kind in Ukraine. So in easy terms, we need to have means of war to win it. We're getting it from EU and the US and we are helping ourselves just as well. Also, first peace summit helped a lot. How come first peace summit, some may ask me. I'll rather divert an option to answer to this question to someone who knows it Best. After the summit in Switzerland, where a diplomatic track has been opened, and the answer from Putin traveling to North Korea, traveling everywhere where he can get arms, is clearly preparing for a long war. In our side, the diplomatic track has to continue working, but we have a, in, to increase our support to Ukraine. We have these revenues coming from the frozen assets and we have to, to look for a way in order to, to use them, avoiding any kind of blockage. You know what? Let's just take a step aside and watch why Ukraine needs as much shells as we can get. Here is what happened in Kiev and Sum and all over Ukraine tonight. <laughs>
This is why we need shells. To end the war in our terms, Ukrainian terms, that is sovereignty and freedom for Ukraine and the world. As we are fighting a bloodthirsty Soviet monster, who, when losing his own turf and on the actual battlefield, sends hundreds of missiles at sleeping cities in Ukraine. And if we fail to defeat him, he will do exactly so to you. While Putin and all his oligarchic inner circle drives German luxury cars, Alternative for Deutschland, local AFD party boss drives Russian-made car Neva. What does it tell us? AFD's solidarity with Putin never was a secret. It is actually Russian Tsar's political outpost in Europe. Remember recent rise of AFD. So what AFD is actually trying to say by driving Putin wagons is to convince the world that Bucha never existed. Ukraine invaded Russia, and Putin is saving the world from Ukro-Nazis. Well, let's pretend to analyze the whole thing, and recently the far-right AFD won the elections in Turinga just as well, securing 32.8 of the votes. Preliminary results showed after all votes were counted. The upstart left-wing party Sarah Wagenknecht Alliance BSW was third with 15.8 of the vote. But not everyone in Germany is happy about AFD showing off. So local leaders of AFD can be driving Russian-made cars just Google, it is fun to watch, by the way, and can consider themselves a force that can be a driver of a change towards what they call a national interest. But all AFD really are is nothing but a Putin's car drivers. And if led to power, will be able of only one thing, drive Putin into Europe on their own backseat. Priorities of the EU and its nearest future in regards of the war. What actually provoked Russian aggression? Enlargement of European Union, our correspondent Vitaly Sizov talks to Andrei Skubelis, twice ex-Prime Minister of Lithuania. Interview on UATV. Thank you that you agreed to talk with me and uh, you was nominated to position in to your commission. Uh, what, what field uh, would be interesting for you which topic is interesting uh, to share your knowledge and your experience and your views? Well, thanks a lot for, for the question, and especially when you are formulating what is my interest, uh, because there are a uh, possibility of different interests. And of course, the most important uh, will be a position and view of uh, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and uh, uh, I will, uh, of course, I will know only when uh, we shall have with her uh, uh, discussions. Still, that is uh, waiting. But uh, uh, if to speak about uh, how I see the whole situation, of course, I think that uh, as a representative of Lithuania, not only uh, me personally, but uh, looking into what is what is Lithuania interest, I can uh, describe it in a very simple way. We have some unique experience. If you look into all the members of European Union, into into the regions, which are related, first of all, with security issues, with defense issues, with EU enlargement. And everything what is related, what I call, you know, uh, Europe East direction, including Ukraine, including Moldova, of course, Western Balkans. And that is where we can uh, give to uh, commission, to new commission, uh, the biggest added. Of course, uh, you know, we can take responsibility for all the different uh, uh, portfolios, uh, economy, energy, transport, and so on and so on, but especially uh, portfolios related with defense, with EU enlargement, 
would be exactly those portfolios where we can bring uh, uh, that added value. And uh, with our experience, with being you know, in the neighborhood of, uh, uh, of, of the region where the threats to security of uh, Europe um, most visible, we, we're next to Russian aggression against Ukraine and so on and so on. So that's what uh, what uh, now I will uh, discuss with uh, Commission President, but of course, both Commission President and also European uh, political parties, I mean, European People's Party to whom we belong, they have their also some kind of vision. And uh, I hope that we shall find the best agreement and the best solution. Mm -hmm. uh, the leader of your party, uh, Manfred Weber, he wanted to see the representative of Lithuania as uh, uh, commissioner in charge for enlargement. Um, be good if <laughs> if that's if that will become a, a reality. <laughs> Uh, from your point of view, this uh, topic uh, was abandoned in Brussels during the last five or ten years. Uh, uh, do you, do, not you, maybe not you, but uh, in particular you, do you think that uh, this topic uh, uh, should be rethink and should be in some case restart? Well, I would say, of course, Till 2022, till Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine, enlargement was not uh, moving ahead. Uh, and we saw it, you know, as some kind of challenge, as a problem. Uh, you know, Western Balkans, which uh, the countries became candidate countries much earlier than Ukraine, also they were not moving ahead. And uh, only the uh, beginning of Russian aggression uh, brought uh, some kind of uh, clear understanding inside of European Union that non-enlargement provokes Russian aggression. Non-enlargement, you know, that leaving such countries like Ukraine, like Moldova, Western Balkans, in some kind of gray zone of, you know, uh, security, uh, creates temptation for Putin, for aggressive, you know, Putin regime uh, to uh, start his aggression, you know, wars and so on and so on. So things are start, started to change after 2022. Ukraine, you know, and Moldova you know, were invited to become a candidate countries. Also, you know, negotiations um, are starting. Things are moving ahead. But still a lot of, you know, um, very practical job and also, you know, political uh, initiatives are needed uh, both, you know, on EU side and also in the candidate countries in order to have uh, an enlargement of success. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're known as a friend of Ukraine and you talk a lot about uh, um, increasing the amount of help, uh, in particular, you actively propagated the idea that uh, uh, EU countries should spend 0.25% uh, uh, of GDP on support Ukraine as a commissioner, possible commissioner. Uh, will you uh, do the same way as official, as official of EU, not politician? Definitely, you know, uh, Ukraine will stay as uh, some kind of really most important strategic priority for the whole European Union for Commission during the next five years. And you can see that priority very clearly in uh, uh, what Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, put into so-called political guidelines, which were, approved, which were announced before um, she got approval from European Parliament. And as uh, Ursula von der Leyen have said, you know, what European Union will manage to do and to achieve during the next five years will influence the future of European Union for the next 50 years. So that's, uh, 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 that is what, you know, what we need to have in mind. Now, uh, 
some policy initiatives which I proposed, you know, uh, during previous Parliament, European Parliament uh, term, they became official policies, uh, for example, of European People's Party. Uh, when we are talking about increase of military support to Ukraine, so that was my idea, which was supported by the uh, European People's Party Congress, that there is a need of European EU plan for the victory of Ukraine, where EU needs to have very clear understanding what EU needs to provide to Ukraine in order for Ukraine to achieve the victory against Russian aggression and uh, to get uh, rid of, you know, Russian occupation of the territories of Ukraine. And exactly from that document, it was very clear, we calculated in a very, very clear way that EU, or in general, the Western support, military support to Ukraine, should be increased by um, 2.5 times, from 0.1% of GDP up to 0.25% of GDP. It can be done either by EU member states deciding to increase their support, especially of those countries which are very much below that percentage, or to achieve collective EU decision to provide such amount of you know, military support by uh, EU finances, from either from EU budget or from from EU special funds, uh, borrowing in the markets or using Russian assets, frozen assets. So that is what will continue to be uh, EPP policy. And, you know, as commissioner representing EPP, of course, I will do everything in order to support some kind of those, you know, initiatives to, to be realized. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see some bottlenecks uh, in current policy of Euro Commission uh, in the sphere of enlargement. What would you change or would not change in uh, policy of e EU Commission in this field for now? We need to understand that enlargement is uh, is a challenge for two sides. For candidate countries, which need to make reforms, and the EU is able to help even more effectively to assist with expertise how some kind of reforms um, can be done. From another side, EU needs also to um, have much more strong consolidated political will in order to achieve such kind of enlargement. And political will depends not only on commission or commissioner, it depends on member states. And that is where really we need to look uh, how we can be more effective in convincing all the member states that EU enlargement is needed not only for Ukraine or for Western Balkan countries, but that EU enlargement is very much needed also for the whole European Union. So that is you know, very important task. It's not a bureaucratic task, it's, it's political, it's you know, social task to speak with the people, to show, you know. Uh, what benefits also the whole Europe will get from enlargement. And uh, that will demand some kind of uh, really political leadership, which Ursula von der Leyen is showing in a, in a very clear way. But of course, commissioners should support, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that um, agenda in the most effective way. Uh, from your point of view, could be... Uh... Uh, understanding of enlargement be changed. Uh, I, I try to explain now when you're talking in some with some officials or people in the EU, they consider enlargement and policy of neighborhood like something uh, EU and closest country. Uh, but maybe it's time to look at this issue like geostrategical issues that neighborhood, it's not like just even Europe region, maybe it's uh, Middle East, uh, other part of the world, from your perspective? Well, you know, Middle East, uh, she's going to create a special commission for Mediterranean region, which of course will include also Middle East. This is very important. But when we're talking about enlargement, we're talking, of course, much more about very concrete, uh, you know, regions. It's, first of all, Western Balkans on one side, on another side, Eastern Partnership countries. 
like Ukraine, like Moldova, while well, Georgia now is, is, is falling behind, is failing with its, with its domestic uh, democracy. I think, uh, I hope that they will recover at some time. But that is where we should concentrate our, our, all our, you know, efforts of enlargement. But enlargement will have much broader impact on development on the European continent. Uh, and uh, in general, you know, uh, both Ukrainian victory and the creation of success of Ukraine through enlargement, through EU membership and through NATO membership, we need to remember that that can have major impact how things will develop in Russia itself or in Belarus, which are still, you know, authoritarian countries. But, uh, uh, you know, EU proper strategy of enlargement and EU proper strategy or, you know, for Ukraine can have the major impact on the uh, possibility of transformation in those, you know, authoritarian regions. And that will be very much, you know, beneficial for stability of peace uh, on the whole European continent. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you for your time, for commentary. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, that was it for today. It was me, Henry Keane, for UATV English. We break the hardest truth in easy terms for you. Please like subscribe and comment in turn. Your voice matters a lot as it helps Ukrainian voice to be heard worldwide. Please stay safe and tune for more already tomorrow. Goodbye.